I'm very grateful to um, uh, my wife, Liz, who's sitting here somewhere in the front, uh, and of course the rest of the family for supporting me over all these years. Um, but most of all, I am grateful for the Mikai community, that's all of you people, um, for the support and encouragement. Um, and we really have a truly um, international community, and I want to reaffirm uh, the importance of having um, this international activity, this international collaboration that we hear all about, and the movement of the scientists and the students uh, between the different labs. Um, because I think, especially at the moment, with some things that are going on, we need to reaffirm that and to um, um, say how fantastic it is uh, that we can achieve all that. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you so much. <laughs>
learning way of filling in the gaps in the abnormal uh, class. We then use this to train a linear model. So that given a new infant, we can construct this connectome, and then we can pass it into our model, and then either predict the outcome directly, or using a trained SVM, we can predict the abnormality or normality of the outcome of either its motor or cognitive function at 18 months. We can also uh, use the tractography and uh, the uh, subnetwork we have to do some visualization. So in a standard prediction model, uh, is, so many people have used the linear regression model, uh, where X basically is a matrix of our features, where each feature is simply the connectivity values of each edge in the connectome. Uh, y are the outcomes, and W can be interpreted as a weighted subnetwork over the connectome. Uh, some other groups have added an L1 linear regression, or sorry, L1 regularizer uh, to create a lasso model, and this is really helpful because we have a high, uh, a large number of features and only a limited number of scans. Um, so this makes uh, the features uh, makes a sparse feature selection. Um, some other groups have extended this to the elastic net model using an L2 regularizer. Uh, but in our case, what we wanted to do was come at it pr from the perspective of. Uh, what do we want this subnetwork to look like uh, using the prior information uh, that we have about the brain? So we do want it to be sparse. Uh, we also want the subnetwork to have non-negative weights because we have a structural connectome where the connectivity uh, between each pair of regions is inherently non-negative because we're counting the number of tracks. So for interpretability, we want the weights to be non-negative. Uh, we also want the network to be anatomically plausible. We don't want uh, connections in our subnetwork between two regions that uh, don't make sense to be connected. And we can look at that from uh, the perspective of SNR, which I'll talk about in a moment. And finally, we want the subnetwork to be well connected. We don't expect that the subnetwork that's predictive of a specific functional outcome will be a scattered set of edges all over the brain network. We think that it, in fact, is going to be at least reasonably well clustered or connected. So we include all of these terms into our objective function. So just focusing on the, the backbone network prior, uh, the main idea is that we want to penalize edges that aren't both strong and consistent. And uh, to add to that, though, we want to make sure that we're not penalizing edges that have high interclass variance because those are probably discriminative. So what we do is we uh, split up um, those uh, abnormal and normal scans in each training set, in each round of cross-validation, and we look at the SNR. The SNR is just basically defined by the mean strength of the connection um, divided by the variance in the connection over the training set. And if either of those are less than one, or sorry, if, if both are less than one, then we penalize that edge. Otherwise, we don't penalize the edge. On the bottom right, you can see an example of the backbone network, which is essentially the network where, all, where B equals zero in all cases. And we can see it makes sense. We have, um, it's fairly symmetric. We have lots of intrahemispherical connections uh, on the cortex. And then we have a few strong interhemispherical connections. So for the connectivity prior, uh, the basic idea is we want to prevent highly disconnected uh, subnetwork by getting edges to share nodes. So you can see in the bottom right there, um, in the far right, we want uh, is a case where we want to incentivize. So if we have two strong edges and they share a node, we're going to incentivize that by multiplying by negative one uh, in the in the or <clears throat> in the objective function. Uh, otherwise, we don't incentivize that. So some results. We ran 1,000 rounds of cross-validation uh, for each method, and uh, we used basically a coarse uh, grid search over powers of two to find uh, the best parameters for each model. And then we examined the correlation between the, gr uh, the ground truth and the predicted BSID scores. We can see as we start with uh, linear regression um, right here, and then we keep adding in the uh, proposed regularization terms, we get a steady increase in uh, correlation values. And then also, if we look at the two class classification results, we have the same story. So as we add in each successive regularization term, we get better and better accuracy. Um, you should note that, so the scores here, 70% uh, accuracy, while it's the highest, it doesn't, may not seem uh, very high, but you have to recall that 
we're basically predicting the future. We're predicting uh, from a scan taken at birth uh, 18 months into the future at a time when the brain is both um, developing rapidly and there's a host of genetic and environmental factors that we can't account for. So then um, we also wanted to look at what was the structure of the subnetworks we're finding. Were the regularizers doing what we hoped they'd they uh, would do. So first of all, across all rounds of cross-validation, we were finding very stable subnetworks, which is good because it means that we're finding something intrinsic in the data where these subnetworks are really corresponding to uh, something important. Then was, uh, we basically start, starting with uh, regular, <coughs> unregularized uh, prediction, as we add in the L1 term, of course it increases sparsity, so 85% of the edges went to zero versus seven, only 7% 7 without. When we added the backbone network in, we reduced the number of low SNR edges by 15%. And then when we add the connectivity prior, it increases the subnetwork efficiency, which is a measure of uh, network integration, by four and a half uh, times. So just looking at our learned motor uh, outcome subnetwork, one thing that we noticed right away is you can see right here below the arrow, the cortical spinal tracts, which are we know are very important for motor function. So that's good. Uh, we thought that if we didn't find these, it would be a problem. But uh, of course, there's, there's other, um, we find other uh, connections in the brain too that seem to be important. <clears throat> and then if we look at the uh, cognitive uh, subnetwork, you can see that specifically one that pops out is the connection between the left and right sup um, superior frontal gyrus in the medial region, which we know is associated with certain cognitive functions. So again, it tells a nice story and it's finding something uh, that we expect. So in conclusion, uh, we introduced novel backbone uh, network uh, prior and connectivity prior, along with a non-negativity term. Uh, each of these priors um, improved our ability to predict uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes, uh, including, and then when we looked at the, the topology of these subnetworks, it reduced noise, increased the integration of the subnetwork, and improve the interpretability uh, of the subnetwork. And also, it allowed us to predict cognitive scores for the first time. Nobody's been able to do this yet, and we first looked at this problem, it was very challenging, we didn't think we'd be able to do it. So we're quite happy that we were able to finally uh, do better than chance on this problem, which our collaborators uh, in the clinical side have said that that was basically the goal, is to do better than chance. Um, and then we were able to get our prediction of neuromotor function above 70%. And also, I'll just add that uh, while we were working on this, we were working on um, uh, the same problem, but from a different perspective, which was the deep learning approach. And we finally, after your work, got that published in NeuroImage last month. Um, and so that's called BrainNet CNN, and you can check it out if you want. Uh, and basically, one of our future works is to try to take these regularization terms that we found to be successful and apply them to our deep framework. And one last note, um, so I've been, uh, working on a big ta table of papers uh, for anybody who's been working in uh, um, machine learning on connectome uh, data, which I know there's a lot of you in the audience. Um, you should check out this website because basically it's uh, something that the community can contribute to and just to basically find out what everybody's working on and get more um, exposure for everybody's work. <coughs> And that's uh, it. I'd like to thank uh, all of our, uh, our sponsors for this work. Thank you. Thank you to the speaker for a great presentation. And now we're open for questions. Uh, go ahead. Thanks. That was really interesting. I've been thinking about something. It's just a comment, actually. I believe that all the current tractography work based on diffusion imaging, is not really able to work out the direction of the production of a fiber tract. Yep. But we know from the classical neuroscience literature that the connections between, for example, two parts of the cortex are not necessarily reciprocal, right. meaning area A can project to B, but sometimes it projects back, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm just a little bit concerned that a lot of the work on the connectome 
hasn't really highlighted the fact that so far we're only talking about half the story and a lot of the understanding about how these networks work will have to come after we resolve this issue. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, th that's, I think that's one deficiency of maybe quite a few others um, that we haven't really addressed yet in tractography in the Connectome uh, community. Um, so, so there's actually a paper I saw, uh, a poster paper for at least on the functional side, they're now starting to look at this, uh, they call it effective connectivity, and they're looking at this uh, directionality in the connectivity, which is interesting and I think useful. Um, I haven't seen anything like that in the con on the structural side, but I, I think yeah, your point is well made, yeah. Uh, what was the justification for doing DTI at birth for 80 babies, or is it part of the standard clinical procedures in the medical center? Uh, it's, it's not part of the standard procedures. This was a, a retrospective study of, of preterm infants. Um, so they were, they were basically, they, they took T1s, T2s, and the DTIs, along with, I think, ultrasound and a host of other um, things, uh, mostly for the purposes of research. Um, I, I guess in, in our case, we were just basically trying to show that if you use this DTI and if it became part of uh, standard practice for preterm infants, uh, you can actually, there's some, you know, important information can come out of that. Um, okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I have one very quick question. Could you give, give us a little insight into how tractography was performed and optimized? Uh, yeah, we just use a standard tractography method here. Uh, we use uh, TrackViz, which I think is uh, an FSL tool. Um, yeah, our, our pipeline was pretty standard, uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the contribution we made was more on what you can do after that. Um, yeah, so in our, in our data set, we found uh, because it's infants, they had a lot of motion, uh, so we had to go through and actually screen the whole data set for uh, cases that didn't, the tractography didn't work on because there was so much motion in the, DT, or, yeah, in the DTI image uh, that tractography wasn't like, robust to. Uh, but I know there's people, uh, working on this problem of motion correction for DTI, so hopefully we'll be able to use those scans too. Great, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Our second presentation comes from INRIA on extracting the core structural connectivity network, guaranteeing network connectedness through a graph theoretical approach. So thank you. Hi. Um, the slides are not, I have no other. Uh, okay, so, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so let me start by motivating the problem. Why do we want to get the core, or as my previous colleague called, the backbone core connectivity matrix? Um, mainly to be able to shed some light into understanding brain structure. The idea will be to get from all these connections that we get from the connectome, of which here I'm showing three different representations, a more synthesized version. Uh, the second one would be to increase statistical power in population analysis. If you're working with a smaller set of features and you're trying to grasp ideas from this or to test hypotheses, this will actually empower your study, which means reducing the, the number of subjects in the population. And finally, to be able to possibly model these connection syndromes, which are believed to be at the origin of many, many pathologies. Um, here we take a different approach to um, our, the previous talk in which, well, from tractography we go to the structural connectivity uh, calculated by the matrices as people usually do, and then we calculate the group-wise core connectivity matrix. Usually nowadays this is done uh, statistically, but we're going to deal with it in a graph theoretical point of view. And that will enable us to try to inject the connectivity um, the connectedness hypothesis into the algorithm. And for, and for this, we're based on recent research or research that has been pushed from the graph theoretical analysis point of views, in which they are maintaining that the brain has a connected core structure with a peripheral, less connected, uh, less connected configuration. Uh, so we will enforce this structure by having a core sub, sub network which is highly connected, sparse connections on the periphery, and will want to be connected all the way, so you can get from one node to the other, any part on the brain. 
Usually it is done statistically. This paper was published in 2009 and has been the golden standard for many, many of the cognitive studies. And what they do to determine if one of the nodes is actually on the binary connect connectome, what they do is hypothesis testing. Yeah. So for each one of the nodes in the matrix, they have the hypothesis that there's no connection whatsoever. And basically they reject the, this hypothesis by doing just a t-test for non-zero mean on any of the measures of connectivity that you might pick. Uh, this has several problems, two of the most important ones being the statistical double dipping, which means that if you do use hypothesis testing to do feature selection, then you cannot perform again hypothesis testing to test any other hypothesis on your, on your resulting data. And the second that you cannot guarantee connectivity, and this might be an important structural property of the graph. So our idea is more based from the graph theoretical point of view, and what we designed is a cost function in which we balance how many subjects have to share one axis for it to be included in the core connectivity matrix. So we have one of the terms that basically counts how many axes, how many edges, how many subjects have this edge to include it, and one who counts in how many it's not included. And then we have a parameter that allows us to balance these two properties to end up with a resulting core, connect core graph. This does not guarantee connectivity, which is one of our main constraints. So for this, what we do is we have an algorithm, which I'm not going to go through. You can get the, the details on the paper or we can discuss them later. But what it basically does is it starts with the optimized graph by minimizing the cost function that I presented before, the text, the disconnected subgraphs that you can find, and then finds a way to connect them back. And finally, we get our structural core connectivity net network. Uh, so interestingly, when you work, when you bring everything to the realm of computer science or graph theory, you can have guarantees of the algorithms that you cannot find in other type of formalisms. For instance, for this algorithm, we were able to formally find demonstrations or proofs that first the algorithm is in polynomial time, which means it runs in a reasonable amount of time. In fact, this is a very, very fast algorithm. Second, we were able to prove that the algorithm is optimal. So for this model that we're proposing, you cannot find an algorithm with lower computational complexity. And finally, the algorithm is exact, which means that if you still are going by the same model that we're proposing, what it means is that for any given data set and parameter, you'll find the global optimum. And you can find like the sketch of the proofs in the, in the paper, and we also have uploaded the full length proofs. So having these guarantees, the first thing that we went with the experiment was to prove that the core graph that we extract is in agreement with the current literature, because there's been an upcoming body of literature on graph theoretical analysis for graphs. And we used one of the main global properties that the graph community is pushing on this, which is the average node, node degree, which means how many, of, how many nodes are connected within the core network. That's, this has been reported to be like a 20% in general. And here what we see in the histogram of like a large set of subjects, which was 300 of which more than half was female, uh, we see that we are between very, very, very close bounds of this number, which means that at least according to graph theoretical hypotheses that are currently on the area and results, we are in agreement. So we are in agreement with current literature. Our second experiment was stability. The, the usual approach that people are using now or have been using for the past like seven years, it's based on statistics, which means that you have a hand, hundred years of literature that assure that when you draw a conclusion from a sample, you can generalize it to a population if you do things right. However, by doing this in terms of graph theory, we don't have this guarantee. So what we did here is with the 300 subjects in our database, we constructed a large uh, leave 100 out experiment in which we're leaving 100 people out of the, of the data set and we're estimating the core connectome at different parameter levels for each algorithm chosen such that the overall graph density is the same across both algorithms. And for this, what we can see, and then we measured which edges were stable, which means were on more than 99.99999% of the cases, and which ones were flickering, meaning appearing and disappearing across these experiments. 
And what we found is basically that we are, are the edges that are unstable are in general an order of magnitude lower than in the current state-of-the-art algorithm, except for the sparser algorithm in which we're a little bit closer. And our final experiment it's, was designed to test whether the core structural connectivity graph that we designed was able to tell us something about the nature of the brain. So we picked uh, an, like another of the running hypothesis on connectivity, which was somehow recently um, supported even more by the work of Ingalenkar et al., even if this hypothesis is still, like most hypothesis of connectivity in the brain under discussion, which was that there is a differential connectivity in the, in the brain across genders. Without dwelling into correlations and consequences of this, we basically took what they did and we constructed a simple linear model in which the female or male tag in our subjects was able to predict connectivity in some of these edges and then we proceeded to test this in a similar type of cross-validation experiment as we did before. So our results were the following. We tested the model in two different ways. First, we tested for whether we were fitting the linear model right, and we did that with the archaic information coefficient, and then we tested prediction. So we left, uh, we left uh, 100 out, and of the 200 remaining, we used 100 for fitting the model and 100 for predicting the connectivity. And what we can see in the results is, in terms of fitting, even if there's like bimodal distributions, which means that probably we have cluster groups within our population, consistently we get an, a smaller number, a smaller score in the archaic information coefficient, which this means, which means that we're fitting the linear model better. And second, also consistently, we get a smaller mean squared error. And this is when comparing, again, our approach with the current state of the art and with doing nothing, which is basically using the graph as you get it from the connectivity. So to summarize this result, our core graph algorithm fits the linear model better and predicts the connectivity better. So summarizing, uh, we presented a new algorithm to extract the core network in the brain. Uh, our algorithm is it's different from the one that's currently used in most cognitive studies uh, in, the, in, the, in that it's based on graph theory. We proved in terms of graph theory and algorithmics that our algorithm runs in polynomial time. It's optimal, which means you cannot go faster than this one. And it, it's exact, which means if you agree with our model, we find the right solution. And then our experimental results show that we're in agreement with current graph theoretical approaches to analyze the connectome. Uh, our graph is stabler than the current statistical one, used the, the current one that's statistically based. And finally, it does a better work on fitting and prediction in one structural connectivity experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a little time for questions. Okay, I'll shoot one off. Um, thank you for some excellent work. In terms of the difference between the core connectivities and the more general uh, continuous connectivities, what do you see the differences in roles there? Can you repeat it? I couldn't hear. So um, you have binarized the connectivity graph to yeah. a core graph and are looking at the core differences between two groups. Others have used those matrices as just floating point matrices and done manifold learning type of things. What do you see the differences there? Yes, well, there, there's two things. Uh, first, uh, one of the main questions in tractography is still if the measure of connectivity actually quantifies some strength of connectivity or some method of communication across the cortex. So a lot of the studies go basically into using the connectivity as whether there is a connection or not. Uh, so we are more on that side. Uh, regardless of that, the, the weights have been used in different experiments and have shown to have some use. So our continuing work is actually trying to generalize this to the weighted graph version. Thank you. I think we have a question in the back. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation first. Uh, I would have a few questions regarding the optimization and uh, the algorithm that you propose. Mm -hmm. um, 
Namely, as far as I know, in general, if you have a graph and you want to find the best subgraph that is connected, it is an NP hard problem. Exactly. And uh, you said that your algorithm is uh, runs in polynomial time and gives you a global optimal solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder what exactly is the difference in your optimization problem and the, uh, the actual minimum cost connected subgraph. Problem. Yes, you're right. The minimum connected subgraph it's completely and it's NP hard, which means it. We, we cannot solve it in reasonable time and probably there's no solution. Here what we did is we sliced the problem in a different way, in a way that makes sense for our application. So it's, if you give a general graph, we'll not get the core connectivity graph. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we, dis we propose this model in which basically we're just counting across a population. So we're not getting the, the minimum subconnected graph of one big graph. We're, we're trying to find a common connected graph across populations, um, across different subjects. So we are merging information from different disconnected graphs. And this type of setting allows us to, to set it up in terms of uh, an objective function that basically counts each edge in how many graphs it's common and in how many graphs it does not appear. And then we can solve the problem in polynomial time. Okay. Okay, so our problem you. cannot be uh, polynomially converted into the global core subgraph for one graph problem. Okay, okay. Um, maybe we can have an offline discussion afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next talk is titled Outcome Prediction for Patients with High-Grade Gliomas from Brain Functional and Structural Networks. This will be presented by Luyan Liu, and it is a collaboration uh, between Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University and the Un University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lu Yan Liu, and I'm from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, today, I will present for you our recent work on overall survival prediction for brain tumor patients using pre-surgical multimodal brain images. Uh, before surgery, doctors will have multimodal images for brain tumor patients. Uh, these are multimodal images for patient A and patient B. Based on these images, it is really hard for doctors to determine the uh, survival time for brain tumor patients. Uh, however, it is, it is very meaningful for doctors to know the survival time before surgery to make better treatment plan. Uh, our study is to use machine learning methods to predict the survival time for brain tumor patients. Uh, we have two strategies to uh, solve this problem. Uh, they are from radiomics and connectomics point of views, respectively. Uh, to the best of our knowledge of the brain, uh, it is a complex network. Uh, these are brain regions, and this is a link between two brain regions, uh, which is called connectivity. With the brain tumor, it will not only cause the lesions in brain images, but also destroy the a brain network. Uh, from the radiomics point of view, the local features extracted within or around the tumor regions can be used to predict the survival time. Uh, uh, these are brain images of, for two patients. It is clear that there are lesions in these two images. Uh, using this kind of imaging features to predict the survival time is called radiomics strategy. From the connectomics point of view, the tumor located in different positions will cause con different consequences. For example, if a tumor located here, it will only affect the connectivity or local efficiency within this subnetwork. So this patient is less affected by the tumor and maybe have long survival time. Uh, if a tumor located between these two subnetworks, and destroy the main connection between them. Uh, the integrity of the whole brain network uh, is, uh, will be destroyed. 
So this, can, uh, this tumor is more devastating, and this patient maybe have a short survival time. In the following slides, I will firstly introduce the connectomic strategy. To obtain brain network, we need to use resting state functional magnetic resonance imaging, which measures spontaneous brain activity by the blood oxy oxygenation level dependent sig signals. So the functional connectivity can, can be computed using spontaneous brain activity. For example, if this bold signal is from brain region I and this bold signal is from brain region J, then the functional connectivity of these two brain regions can be measured by the correlation of these two bold signals. This value is corresponding to one element in the functional uh, connectivity network. The functional connectivity network can be computed by co co compute all the correlation of each pair of brain regions. This net network reflect, reflect how our brain regions interact with each other. Actually, there are many methods to measure functional connectivity network. In our study, we have two different methods to measure the functional connectivity network. Uh, one is called static low order brain functional connectivity network. As we have said in the previous slides, we can get entire both signals for each brain region from resting state functional MRI, MRI. Then a functional connectivity network can be co computed using the methods like Pearson's correlation, partial correlation, uh, spatial representation based methods, of, and so on. Uh, it is well known that uh, one brain region generally interacts with only a small number of other brain regions. So for brain region I, so for brain region I it can be sparsely represented by the remaining brain regions. Uh, this, is a, this is called uh, sparse representation based methods. Uh, however, uh, the traditional sparse representation based methods usually use uh, squared L2 norm, norm loss function to model the network. However, it is not robust to the noise connection or you know, spurious connection. So in this study, we use a robust functional connectivity method which utilize a non-squared L2 norm loss function. This um, non-squared L2 norm loss function make the insignificant connections have less important li uh, than the squared one. And uh, L1 norm regularizer rather is also utilized to enforce the sparsity of the estimated functional connectivity network. Since uh, this static low order functional network can only measure the static functional connectivity, so we use another kind of method to measure the dynamic functional connectivity, which is called a uh, dynamic high order brain functional connectivity network. Uh, unlike um, use the entire bold signal. We use some small segment of bold signals. With each segment, we can uh, com uh, compute uh, a functional network. When uh, these uh, windows uh, wind window moves forward, a lot of functional uh, network can be constructed. So, for a pair of brain regions I and J, we can calculate a series functional connectivity values, uh, which is called functional connectivity time series. For another pair of brain regions, M and N, another functional connectivity time series can be computed. Finally, a high order functional connectivity network can be constructed by computing the correlation of functional connectivity time series. Uh, this method can achieve much more information than the static one. Since these two kind of networks um, are constructed from a different functional connectivity point of view, and they can also uh, pro, uh, provide complement, complementary information. So we propose to use both of them pr to predict the survival time for uh, brain tumor patients. Um, in the framework, we firstly construct a high order and a low order functional networks. Um, then network properties like degree, shortest path length, clustering coefficient, uh, bitterness, uh, global efficiency, local efficiency are ex extracted as features. After feature extraction, a lasso feature selection is performed and two SVM classifiers 
uh, like SVM1 and SVM2 are built uh, from the uh, based on the features selected from high order and low order network respectively. Finally, the classification score um, of, uh, the, uh, of these two SVM models are fused together by a weighted, a weighted average to uh, make, uh, make the final decision. In this study, the patient who lives lo no longer than 650 days will be classified into the short survival time group. The reason that we use the 650 days as a threshold is that it is a medium survival time of patients with high order brain tumor. Uh, now we show the experimental results. We use 68 high-grade glioma patients with 34 from long survival time group and uh, 34 from short survival group. Uh, short survival time group. Uh, the prediction accuracy of using uh, clinical features is only 63.2 percent. When we use a uh, Pearson's correlation or um, partial correlation, the accuracy is or even worse than using clin uh, clinical features. All our methods achieve over 80% accuracy with, uh, with low order and high order methods. We can achieve 80.9% and 85.3% accuracies. When we combine them together, we can further improve the accuracy to 86.8%. Eight, uh, um, all the methods achieve uh, the similar sensitivity and the specificity. It is clear that our method outperforms the traditional uh, methods. Uh, after introduced our connectomics strategy, I'd like to, uh, in the following slides, I'd like to introduce our another radiomics based methods. Mm, in this method, uh, rather than use only one model images, we use uh, multimodal brain images, which include T1 MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, and functional MRI. For T1 MRI, we use contrast enhanced T1 images. For DTI, we compute multiple diffusion metrics. Each of them is one channel. So for DTI data, we have multi-channel images. For functional MRI, we compute frequency power at different frequency bands. Uh, these are the multi-channel images for functional MRI. The local imaging features are then extracted from all of these images. Next, I will introduce more details about this uh, method. For T1 data, we use a 3D CN model, which concludes convolutional layer, fully connected layer, and layers, and the soft max loss function to predict the survival time and learn better high level features. Uh, for multi channel DTI images, we use a multi channel 3D CN model. Uh, in this model, a fusion layer here enables the multi channel DTI images to support each other to learn high order features, which are, which are able to better support, uh, predict the survival time. Similarly, for multi-channel functional MRI, we also use a multi-channel 3D CN model. Uh, unlike the traditional methods, which use the three, uh, output of 3D CN to make the final de decision, in our study, we extract the features from fully connected layers, which enable the imaging features from the multi-model images to, um, better, uh, um, to better predict the survival time. Uh, we, we then fuse the features together and use the SVM classifier to predict the survival time. Here uh, are the experimental results. Uh, our methods outperform other methods uh, like using clinical features, higher features, shift features, and 2 dcn methods. As for sensitivity and specificity, our methods uh, are all, are, is also outperform other methods. Um, after introduced uh, our connectomics and uh, radiomics based methods, um, now I will uh, give a brief uh, summary here. First, both of these two methods achieve superior performance to predict the overall survival with high accuracy. Second, our study shows the sig significant potential of preoperative MRI for the overall survival prediction. Uh, in the future, we hope to further improve the prognostics accuracy by combining these two strategies together. 
Uh, these are all my presentations today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the talk. Uh, now it's open for questions. All right, well, I have one question. Um, could you give us any insight to where the predictive locations in the brain were? Were they widespread oh, they or are, localized? Uh, oh, they are nearby the tumor regions. For, for the radiomics, they're nearby the tumor regions? Uh, or for, for the connectomics also? Um, uh, can you repeat? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, were the regions that you found in the end that were predictive uh, of the outcome? Um, mm, these regions are drawn by three radiologists, and the final regions are defined by all of these three radiologists with an agreement. Okay, thank you. We have, a, I think, a question up here. Yeah, just, just a question about your... Uh, the high order network in the first okay. uh, part. Um, okay. It looked like, so I, I saw from the numbers as it was said it was 600 by 600 size matrix. I was just wondering how you got that number because it seemed like it should be every pair of edges, which would be a larger A pair matrix. of edges? Uh, right. You mean, uh, uh, can you repeat as well? Uh, so, repeat so in the high order network, what I understood you're doing is you're taking a signal from each edge, right? And then you're, you're correlating a pair of edges, right? Every pair of edges, you're, you're computing a correlation oh, for that. Yes. So, uh, in the high order networks, there are many edges. Um, maybe mm, nearby, uh, nearby seventy thousand uh, edges. Right. Yes. It, it just seems like it should be even higher than that. Like, wouldn't it be the number of edges in your original matrix squared, or something on that order? Um, uh, these edges are the correlation of the functional connectivity time series. Uh, this functional con connectivity. Uh, yeah, let me ask a question for, for her. Basically, you know, yeah, there's a lot of you know connection, you know, from the matrix. Basically, we, what we did is for the clustering. We class them into 600 clusters. Then, you know, each cluster you have, you know, a mean, you know, uh, correlation time series. Then you do the correlation between them. In this way, you get a high order network. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, but we'd like to thank the speaker again for the wonderful talk. And our next presentation is a continuous model of cortical connectivity from the University of Southern California, and Daniel Moyer will be presenting. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Daniel Moyer, and I'll be presenting a continuous model of cortical connectivity. So uh, let's get started. You probably all are aware, but this is the uh, classical model of networks. So we have nodes and edges on the left-hand side, and uh, on the right-hand side, a weighted adjacency matrix. And of course, we're in connectomics, so this is going to have a brain behind it. Um, but actually, in connectomics, we're, we're looking at regions of the brain, so we have a, a regional connectivity, and we still have an adjacency matrix. But these regions have sizes and shapes and geometry. And uh, based on this, this model, we can actually give a, a standard pipeline that, uh, that looks like this. First, we'll parcelate the cortex, fit some tracks, um, construct our networks. So usually we count track endpoints between uh, two different regions, but we can also weight them by FA or something. And then uh, measure network statistics. And after that, we publish a lot. And uh, yeah. So uh, this, we actually have, as a community, I feel that we have done some very good work with this standard model. Um, however, I would like to focus on several problems, uh, three problems with this model. Uh, and the first is that tracks have noise. They actually have very hard to model noise. It's geometric noise. Um, and so it deals with the track endpoints, which is not easily modeled by a discrete network, which leads us to our second point, that nodes are atomic, but brain regions are not. And nodes uh, are only, in, only have incident edges, but brain regions have interiors and exteriors and boundaries and geometry and all kinds of other uh, continuous or continuum sort of uh, properties that are not easily modeled by discrete topology. Uh, and third, and perhaps the most troubling, is that there's no agreed upon 
uh, standard parcellation. So what we're seeing here is actually the HCP parcellation, which came out over the summer. It's a very good one. It has 160-ish uh, regions. But it's not comparable to the free surfer parcellation I was just showing you. Um, and, and why is it not comparable? Um, well, we tested this empirically, uh, or many people have, that uh, our favorite network statistics from earlier are not invariant under the uh, choice of parcellation. In fact, some of them are, are very unstable. Um, and there's also some belief uh, recently that w there may not even be a best parcellation, that if we're trying to choose a good one, we actually should choose multiple or many and do this analysis on many scales. Um, so we would like to address these, these problems. What can we do about this? Um, and that's the focus of our paper, is a parcellation independent representation of connectivity. Um, how do we construct this? Well, here we go. So starting at the network model again, and we have a brain behind it, and uh, we have regions still, but now we remember that the, these methods for fitting these uh, regions, uh, they're much more accurate in the center of the region than they are toward the exterior, especially the atlas-based methods where this is almost designed. Um, as you reach the exterior of the, uh, of the region, it becomes fuzzier and blends into the next region. Now, this may not be true in every case, but if we can imagine this fuzziness in, in some cases, we could then imagine a, a fuzzy adjacency matrix or perhaps an adjacency function. And if we're imagining an adjacency function, then we can imagine a coordinate-based connectivity model. So an adjacency function over the, the coordinates of, of, the, of the surface. Um, let's make, we wanna design this, so let's make this a little more uh, rigorous. That we want a parcellation independent connectivity model and we want it to be partial, parcellationable. So we, want, we still want to use all these parcellations. They've been very carefully constructed. So can we go back from continuous to discrete? We want it to be computable. Um, this is not a theory exercise. We actually do want to use this in, in, in real life. And we also want it to be reliable and robust to the noise we were talking about earlier. Um, so these are ob objectives for this model and we're gonna build a model that does all of these, um, hopefully. So we're gonna use random processes, we're gonna use point processes to, to accomplish this. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, a uh, point process is a random process that generates point patterns, so sets of points. Uh, we're using the simplest of them, which is the Poisson process. So essentially we're drawing from a, an intensity function which looks something like a, a statistical distribution, except it doesn't have to integrate to one. This one actually integrates to 100. Um, and we draw a set of points. So instead of drawing one point, we're actually getting a set as a realization of this process. Um, estimation can be done similar to, or at least in the Poisson case, can be done similar to the uh, statistical distribution where you're using a KDE in our case, but you could also use splines. Um, the Poisson process has this uh, nice property which we'll leverage, which is that for any region, the number of events in that region, so the number of points, uh, is Poisson distributed the Poisson process, uh, with a parameter equal to the integral of the intensity function over the region. So hold this in the back of your mind as we go forward. This is going to be useful. Um, but in our context, events are observed tracked endpoint pairs, and the domain is the space of all pairs of points on the cortical surface. You could also use uh, gray, matter gray matter voxel coordinates. Um, so we have the cortical surface, or the gray matter, cross the cortical surface, so pairs of points. And uh, we're gonna use uh, the inflation of the cortical surface after recovering the points uh, because our, our math is uh, better on the sphere. So uh, at once we realize that this intensity function on the space, uh, on the connectivity space, so that's the surface cross the surface, this intensity function is exactly what we wanted. This is exactly uh, continuous connectivity. Um, and we're gonna recover it using a kernel density estimator. So here's our procedure. We're gonna recover the cortical surfaces. We're gonna register the surfaces. We'll define a kernel on, on the sphere, and we'll involve the endpoints of every track with, this, with the product kernel, because remember, we're, we're doing the, the product of the cortical surfaces, and we'll sum up the convolved kernels to get our estimate. This looks complicated because we're, we're using a, a heat kernel, and the spectral form is, is perhaps the best form in, in our opinion. But the bottom line, uh, the bottom equation, uh, shows you the, the main part, which is that it's product kernel and it's got one parameter, which is a bandwidth parameter. Um, we're using, the, we're using the, the spectral form of this, the 
spectral, uh, spherical harmonic form for this reason, that uh, it turns out that, the that this kernel is a function of the bandwidth times a function of the data, so it's separable and we can learn it in linear time. So if we choose a large number of sigma, we can learn the optimal sigma given a criterion. And that criterion we're gonna use is an integrated squared error. There are actually a large number of, of good criteria for uh, kernel density estimates, but we're choosing this one. Um, and we could have used a, a different one if, you, if you'd like, so yeah. The first thing we're gonna do with it is visualize it, of course, because we're imagers. And uh, we have to integrate over a region to visualize it because the actual object is four-dimensional or uh, on two, two spheres. So uh, if we integrate over the left post-central gyrus, this is the connectivity, the continuous connectivity that comes out. Um, so now we wanna go back from our continuous connectivity to discrete. So given a parcellation, choose any parcellation, uh, we, can, we can find the expected number of tracks by integrating over the regions, or the pairs of regions, really. So that's the expected number of tracks from one region to the other is the integral of the intensity function that we just recovered. So using this, we can actually compare our, our work to uh, regular count matrices, and it turns out, at least using ICC, that we're doing a lot better. Um, so we have test-retest data. We have about 30, uh, 30 subjects scanned twice within two weeks, and we recover tracks for all of them, and we make matrices and see how correlated they are with themselves. And it, it appears that we're uh, approximately two or three times better under ICC. These are preliminary results. We, we would suggest more testing, but uh, this seems to be a good thing. Um, but you can also use this to, uh, you can also use this to choose the best parcellation. So here we have three criteria for choosing a good parcellation. Um, one is based on the L2 error, so assuming that the graph is a, a piecewise approximation to our continuous function, uh, we have an L2 error, but we could also use the model itself, so we could have a likelihood, we want the maximum likelihood, or we could use uh, Ikaike's information criterion, um, so we'll penalize by the number of, of regions we'll have. And uh, at least for the likelihood-based criteria, our preliminary results show that uh, we can, that the standard, the default free surfer 64, or 60, 68 parcel connectivity, or parcellation, uh, does, does well, but again, this requires more testing. Um, and, yeah, so to recap, have we constructed parcellation independent? Yes. Parcellationable? Yes. Computable? Yes. Uh, there are probably better tricks to do this, but I think we did pretty well. Um, and is it reliable and reproducible? Our preliminary results suggest yes as well. Um, so a, a few notes about this. We found a bug about five weeks ago in our code. Uh, and we notified the program chairs immediately. The results are qualitatively similar. So if you look on archive, there's an updated paper. Um, we apologize about this if there's any confusion. Um, but it's only in numerics and only in the ICC scores. Um, the code will be on GitHub soon. So if you would like to, to play around with this, this would be great. Um, but in the meantime, you can email us and we'll keep you updated about it. Uh, some known, so back to this. Uh, we clearly didn't solve all these problems. In fact, uh, th there's a long way to go. But we would encourage uh, moving forward that, that we focus on these types of problems that go beyond the usual network uh, network models and network models of, of, of noise, uh, and that we focus on this as a community uh, we, because we think it's very important. So uh, we'd like to thank the Mackay committee members and organizers, uh, the, the reviewers, uh, our, our funding agencies, um, and thank you. Thank you very much. I th um, is that a question? No, sat in the back. So I'll shoot off with one. Um, thank you for some excellent work on the connectivity. You didn't give us many details on the initial tracking and how you set up that connectivity matrix. Can you fill us in a little bit? Yeah, so the initial tracking is done uh, using a constrained spherical deconvolution method. Uh, so we have a global tractography which is probabilistic. So, um, I guess you can see the, the paper for 
absolute details. Um, but we're, we're tracking in, in a usual fashion, we, we, we believe. And then constructing the count matrices, we're using, uh, we're using this, the surface vertices from FreeSurfer. Um, for the continuous one, obviously, we don't have parcellations, so. Thank you for a great talk. Um, you showed us visualizations of a slice of this continuous yep. connectivity. Do you have any ideas on how to visualize the full function? Uh, so if you were to take level sets, for example, oh. uh, you could show uh, something like tubes or, or, or actually the tracks in those level sets if you'd like. Um, however, it is a, a sphere across a sphere, so that is problematic to visualize. Um, I personally like the slice method um, because it allows us to focus on certain regions, but uh, there are probably clever ways of visualizing it that we just haven't thought of. Thank Great, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next talk is titled Correction of Fat Water Swaps in Dixon MRI. And this is from Imperial College London. And it will be presented by Ben Glocker. Thank you. Slight change of topic. So fat water imaging is an important diagnostic tool where the separation of fat or the suppression of fat can help us to identify patterns of disease such as edema or inflammation or enhancing tumors. But also the fat signal it, it itself can highlight pathologies such as fatty tumors. And the separation of fat allows us to do quantifications, for example, of um, visceral adipose tissue. A widely used technique is chemical shift-based fat water separation, which is commonly known as Dixon MRI. In the very simplistic form of Dixon MRI proposed in 84, we simply acquire two images at two different phases, one in-phase image and one out of phase image. Now if we just subtract the two, we should ideally just get an image or we can obtain an image which has only fat uh, signal because the water cancels out. If we add the two, the fat should cancel out and we can obtain a water only image. However, in practice it's a little bit more complicated. Normally multi-point techniques have to be used and also advanced mathematical optimization methods are employed to actually compute the fat and water only images. There is a major problem in Dixon MRI which concerns fat water swaps. It's a well known problem. It is caused by natural ambiguity in the phase encoding, so sometimes water can look like fat and vice versa. But also, fat separation is quite sensitive to uh, field inhomogeneities. And the optimization methods that are employed, for instance, the popular ideal method, can actually converge to the wrong substance due to local minima and other problems. So here are some visual examples of what we encountered in our database. There can be left-right swaps, where the left, image, uh, the left side of the image and the right side of the image are differently weighted. In whole body MRI, where we often have to acquire several stations and then stitch them together, it can happen that a whole station is swapped. Here's another example of a left-right swap in the lower extremities. And this is a particular interesting case where we have a local region that is swapped, as we can see here, for the left and the right kidney. So robust estimation of fat water separation is a very active field of research. So there is a lot of works, um, for instance, extensions to the original ideal method. There are alternative optimization approaches, for instance, using discrete methods like graph cuts or quadratic pseudo-Boolean optimization. There are also techniques that would allow us to recover fat water swaps from the images. However, to the best of our knowledge, all previous methods do require either the original echo sequences or a B0 field map, and those are commonly not available once the images are reconstructed and stored. So these days, all major vendors would provide some sort of Dixon MRI imaging protocol, which then normally gives you those four images, an in-phase, out-of-phase, a fat, and a water-only image. So we ask the question whether we can actually correct fat water swaps retrospectively, just given those four images. 
So why is it important? It is estimated that between 5 and 10% of all Dixon MRIs that are acquired do contain some sort of PET water swap, which can lead to errors in radiological reading. It can lead to incorrect quantifications. And it can also invalidate, for instance, attenuation correction in PET-MR, where, where the Dixon sequence is often used to estimate attenuation coefficients from MR images. In a 2014 study, it was found that if we estimate the average fraction of PET from brain scans, and we make sure that the images are all swap-free, this fraction should be around 13%. However, if they just used a random set of clinical data, where there were, were pet water swaps present, this was grossly um, misquantified uh, 50, with 56%. In our own pilot study, we could show or we found that in the UK Biobank Imaging Study, which is a large or the world's largest population study currently undergoing, where comprehensive imaging data is acquired from 100,000 subjects, that between 8 to 10 percent of the acquired abdominal Dixon MRIs do have some pet water swaps. So at the end of the study, this would mean there are up to 10,000 images that had this type of artifact. So how can we correct pet water swaps? Our solution to this is Dixon Fix, which looks at the fat and water only images. And here, as we can see, there is a fat water swap present uh, for the left and the right kidney. We take the original in-phase and out-of-phase images as an input, and then we use a regression method to predict swap-free fat and water-only images. Now, these predictions on its own are not directly useful because they are low quality, they don't show great details, and at the end they are synthesized images. However, if we compare them to the original fat and water-only images in a voxel-wise manner, it could define us a likelihood for each of the voxels how likely it is that there is a fat water swap present by just comparing the intensities. So using such a likelihood term, we can then define a binary labeling problem that we can solve with graph cards, and that would give us a swap labeling that we could then use to correct the images by simply swapping intensities in the original fat and water only images. So let's look at some of the details of our method. So basically there are these two steps. In the first step, we try to predict these swap-free fat water images. So in order to do this, the first thing we need is a database. So we collected images for which we know they are swap-free. This, this was basically done by visual confirmation. And once we have that database, our goal is to learn a discriminative model that would allow us to take from a test image and the in and the out of phase images and predict swap free fat and water only images. Now we employed regression forest for this because it was shown that they work reasonably well for image synthesis problems in previous work. Regression forests are relatively easy to implement and the way they work, we look at patches of our input data. We can extract features from there, for instance, using popular randomized box features, which would then allow us at training time to cluster the training data. And in the leaf nodes, we would then store empirical distributions, so in this case over the water and the fat intensities, which we can then use at test time to predict how a fat and water only image should look like for that particular test case. So once we are able to predict those swap-free images, we can talk about the likelihood term that I mentioned and the labeling problem. To this end, we define a conditional random field with binary random variables associated with each of the voxels in the original volumes, so these axes here. And each voxel is, or each hidden binary variable is associated with a observed variable Y here, which simply contains the fat and the water intensities from the original images. And the unary potentials in this CRF then define our likelihood term, where we say if we assign a zero to a variable, which means this voxel should not be swapped, then we say that the intensities should be somewhat closed in the original image and the swap-free image in terms of absolute difference. And we weight this by, um, by the standard deviation here. 
However, if we see that a voxel should be swapped, this means that the likelihood term should be uh, telling us that the original intensities should be closer to the respective counterpart of the, of the prediction. Now, in order to impose some regularization, we use the pairwise potentials to give a very simple regularization term here, which just is a POTS model that gives us a penalty term lambda whenever we try to assign two different um, values to the binary variables that are connected, so the neighboring nodes in the graph. So these two potentials constitute then our binary labeling energy, which we can solve globally optimal by our graph cuts, which then gives us the labeling that we need, the swap labeling, in order to correct the images. To the experimental evaluation, so far we used 46 subjects of whole body Dixon MRI. We found that in 10 of those subjects, we had various types of fat water swaps. We used 23 swap-free subjects to train the regression forests. And to the results, we could show that in all 10 subjects, we could successfully correct the fat water swaps that were present. However, in 13 swap-free test images, we found that there were always some voxels incorrectly labeled as being swapped, which at the end constitutes about a false positive rate between 0.3 and 0.9%, so really just a small part of the image that was incorrectly labeled. Regarding runtimes, the step one of image synthesis for a whole body MRI takes roughly about 10 minutes with the regression forests and the additional multi-resolution graph cut to compute the labeling is done within a few seconds. Here are some visual examples or some visual results. So in this image, we have a abdominal MRI where the top station was swapped, but also note that at the lower arms on the left and at the right, there were some swaps present in the images and our method correctly detected those swaps and then we could use this to correct the images. Another case where the left and right kidney had different weightings, again, our method finds this local, in this, this case, an irregular shaped region that needs to be swapped, and again, we could use this to correct the images. A typical case of fat water swaps where something happens towards the boundaries of the image because of inhomogeneity, so here the head neck area, if you notice, is swapped between the two images, again, correctly detected and corrected. And another case of a left-right swap for the lower extremities, again, correctly detected and then corrected. Note that the horizontal stripe here is not actually an artifact of our method, but of the, an artifact of the rather poor stitching of the stations for the whole body MRI. To some limitations, as I did mention, we do find swaps in swap-free images, so we could currently not use this directly to confirm that a scan is actually swap-free. However, because of the false positive rate being relatively low, we believe that by just incorporating a little bit more sophisticated priors in the CRF, we could mitigate that problem easily. It is hard to quantify uh, any results here except for false positive rate. Uh, of course, one could think about using synthetic data as also pointed out by some of the reviewers. However, random swaps are possible but might not be realistic, so it's still then hard to say how good is the actual algorithm. It might be a option if we compare different algorithms, but since there is currently no other method for doing this, um, that might be something for future work. The same is true for manually annotating swaps, which is probably the best thing to do in really to get quantifications of how how sensitive the algorithm is, but obviously that's tedious and time consuming and something we consider for future work. So to conclude, one could actually ask, is fat water swaps not actually an acquisition problem and not an image computing problem? And shouldn't we try to prevent it from happening in the first place? And I actually believe yes, but apparently it's difficult. So if we look at the MRI physics literature, there are a lot of approaches for more robust fat water separation, and still we find it is a very uh, prevalent uh, artifact in, in clinical data. So here we say Dixon Fix is a simple yet effective solution. We can repair images that have been already acquired. We don't need access to the original echo sequences. 
Now, this is extremely important in cases of large-scale studies. For instance, the UK Biobank, as I said, is the world, world's largest population uh, imaging study currently undergoing, where they already have 10,000 images acquired, and it's very, very unlikely that the imaging protocol will change for the next 90,000. And as there are pet water swaps present, we believe that with Dixon Fix, we are able to correct the images that are currently corrupted, and thus we can make as many images as possible available for further analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now open for questions. There's someone walking, I think he's going to the mic. No, nope. all right. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. I do have a quick question for you. Oh, you know, actually, we are over time. I'll have to take my question offline. Thank you so much for your talk. Our next talk is going to be on 4D phase contrast magnetic resonance um, cardioangiography, cre um, creation from 4D flow MRI. And the speaker is Mariana Bustamante from Link Chapin. Thank you. Um, I chose to wear a wireless mic. I hope you can hear me too. I, do, I don't want to hide myself behind the podium. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a method uh, to create angiographic imaging uh, from 4D flow MRI. Uh, and we, uh, we have called it uh, four-dimensional cardiogeography. Uh, so some background, uh, what is a PCMRA or a phase contrast magnetic resonance angiography? Um, it is an image, a uh, magnetic resonance uh, acquisition type, uh, which goal is to generate an image uh, that reflects the velocity in each voxel. So for my 3D image, I want uh, the intensity of each voxel to represent uh, the, the velocity that goes through that voxel uh, wh while the heart is beating. Uh, they are typically acquired without cardiac gating in a breath hole. Uh, this means that the heart is beating as the, as the, imaging is, as the MRI machine is taking this image, but the machine is doing any, nothing about it. Uh, so motion present during the cardiac cycle will be averaged in the resulting image. Uh, so the result of this acquisition is typically four three-dimensional images, a magnitude usually uh, used to, uh, for anatomical orientation, and then three directions of velocity, x, y, and z, uh, and then we generate an image that looks like this. Uh, so then 4D flow MRI is the type of imaging that uh, we are uh, working with, um, and it's a very similar uh, phase contrast magnetic resonance acquisition type. However, the goal now is to visualize the flow of blood throughout the cardiac cycle. So I not only want to know if there is blood going through that voxel, yes or no, I also want to know where is that blood coming from, where is it going to, and what is happening with the heart as it's beating uh, through the cardiac cycle. Uh, so they are acquired using cardiac gating. This means that motion of the heart and vessels over the cardiac cycle now is included in the images. And the result of my acquisition is four four-dimensional volumes. So just as before, but now the volumes are four-dimensional. Imagine that the velocities are beating as well. And the fourth dimension is uh, the time. <laughs> Um, so we can do, for example, visualizations such as this. We can look at what is happening with the flow of blood inside the heart uh, as the heart is beating and what is happening uh, with, uh, in the vessels and how the vessels are moving through the cardiac cycle. Um, so one of the things that is very commonly done from 40 floor MRI is the creation of uh, PCMRA data. So we combine the information in a 40 floor MRI acquisition uh, to reproduce or mimic what would have happened if we'd have taken, we would have taken a PCMRA instead, um, to ob obviously to visualize the flow. Uh, so this is done with a pretty simple formula usually. Um, we have an absolute velocity, which is a magnitude uh, of the vector of the velocity vectors uh, multiplied by a magnitude, which gives me some uh, sort of anatomical information. And then a very important step, it is the average over time. Um, that means that I'm reducing my four dimensional image into three dimensions, so I'm losing my time dimension. Uh, so the result of my PCMRA is a, three, is a three dimensional volume with average information from all the time frames. Uh, so this is how it looks for two, uh, oh sorry, for two previous methods uh, previously presented. And the formulas are a bit changed, but they are in general the same thing. Uh, we have a 
uh, velocity vector, we have our magnitude and an average over time in both cases. And this is kind of the visualizations that are usually done with this type of images. To the left in both, ca both cases, we have just a slice in my 3D volume in the center a maximum intensity projection and to the right an isosurface. And the most important thing to remember here is that these images are three dimensional. They are an average over time. We have lost our, the information in time. Uh, so how do we want to improve this? Uh, the, the method that we are presenting here, we want to generate angiographic data from 44 MRI with two main objectives. The first is to allow visualization of the motion of the heart and major vessels throughout the cardiac cycle. So we want to use the full information contained in the 40 flow MRI. Uh, and we want to enhance the intensities in the heart ventricles and atria to improve their discernibility. To, so we want to be able to see uh, uh, intensities also in areas where flow is not as strong, such as the heart apex or the atria of the heart. And then we have created a four-dimensional phase contrast magnetic resonance cardioangiography, or 4DPC MRCA. Um, so it's a very simple formula. Again, we have the same things. We have a magnitude or absolute velocity, and we have added a gamma correction to improve that, uh, those sort of intensities in the areas of lower flow. And then now the most important thing is we will not do an average over time. We want to keep the information in four dimensions. Um, uh, so the result up to this point is n volumes, n being the number of time frames that I have. Um, with intensities that depend on the blood flow patterns at each time frame. So it is still a four-dimensional image. Um, so now the thing that we want to do is to combine all of these images into one three-dimensional image, but without losing time dimension. Um, so, so far what we have is, for example, uh, an, uh, a, a four-dimensional image with 40 volumes, let's say that I have 40 time frames, and then in areas such as in and systole, where the heart is just beating, we have a very bright aorta, but we have dark in, darker other places. And then we have another volume uh, in mid-diastole, where the heart is filling up, and then that area of the heart is brighter, but the rest of the image is uh, darker. So we want to combine this without losing time. Um, so we will use non-rigid registration between the time frames of the magnitude data. We will, we in this case, selected one time frame in diastasis or mid-diastole. And we will do registration from all of the time frames in my magnitude data to that one time frame. Now, those, uh, those, those deformations resulting from the registration will be used to transform each time frame P, our PCMRA that we created in the previous step. Uh, and then each time frame will be deformed with its corresponding deformation field. Now the result is similar to what we had before, n volumes with intensities that depend on the blood flow patterns at each time frame. But now, the shape and morphology will be the expected in that chosen time frame that we selected before. So now we have a three-dimensional PC MRCA, uh, which is calculated as a maximum intensity projection of these images over time. So this is the same as we were doing before with the average in the other methods, but now we know that this image corresponds to a very specific time frame that we had selected. So we have not lost that time uh, dimension. Uh, and now we can use registration again to transform a 3D PCMRCA into a four-dimensional image. We will use sort of the opposite registration. We will, uh, we will register the, same, the magnitude image from diastasis to all of the other uh, time frames, and we will use those deformations uh, on our 3D image to obtain a four-dimensional image again. Um, so this is kind of how it looks in comparison. We have these are two uh, PCMRA uh, methods that I had shown before. And this is the 4D PCMRCA in the same visualization that we have done before. And then the main difference here is that these images, again, we don't know which time frame they belong to. They don't have a time dimension anymore. While the 4D PCMRCA, we can we have for each time frame a specific volume, and we can create visualizations that show us what exactly is happening with the heart as it's beating through the cardiac cycle. So this is how it looks in uh, two data sets. Uh, to the left is just an isosurface, and to the right, we have also segmented the aorta, pulmonary artery, and cavo veins. And we can see that there is a lot of motion happening in the vessels as well, not only in the heart. And this is motion that is usually not taken into account when doing uh, calculations with PCMRA data. Um, so a bit more about the motion. Here we have the a four-chamber view of the heart. We have the, the right side of the heart, the left side of the heart, in red PCMRCA, it's a 3D image, so it's not moving. 
and, and blue 40 PCM RCA, and it's beating with the heart. And then the same for the vessels. This is the ascending aorta, pulmonary artery, and descending aorta. And you can see that there is also motion. It's sort of more modest motion, but it's still there. And it can be important if we're trying to calculate something that, for example, is close to the vessel wall, such as wall shear stress. If the vessel is moving, we're completely out of place in half the time frames. Um, so we evaluated the method on 1040 flow MRI data sets acquired uh, from healthy volunteers, generated 4D PCM RCAs and 3D PCM array data for each data set, and maximum intensity projections of each method were compared, uh, and um, anatomical regions of the cardiovascular system were scored independently by two observers. And then if you can see the results, um, on the top here we have the in the vertical axis, the average score, it was from one to four, and on the horizontal axis, uh, the different regions that we scored, aorta, pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, cava veins, left side of the heart, right side of the heart, and carotid arteries. And we can see that the PCMRCA in field blue had higher average for all the, all the regions. And then below we have, to the left, the PCMRA uh, obtained mostly scores of twos and threes, while the PCMRCA obtained scores of mostly threes and fours. Um, so finally, uh, 4 pcm RCA can be generated from 4D flow MRI to visualize the motion of the heart and vessels throughout the entire cardiac cycle. So we are using all of the information available in the 4D flow MRI. We're not only sort of trying to mimic what is happening with another type of acquisition. Uh, and then finally, in our visual evaluation, the 4D pcm RCA outperform uh, 3D pcm RA for visualization of the main anatomical regions of the cardiovascular system especially where cardiac or vessel motion was present. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have uh, longer questions, I have a poster session tomorrow. Thank you. We have a little time for questions. So I'll start one off. Um, it's fascinating work with this visualization. What are the requirements on the scan time versus a more traditional approach to get the same SNR? Um, so, 40 flow MRI takes about, I think it's about 10 minutes um, with, without any breath holds, which is important for the, for the patient, especially if they have any cardiac problems. So, about 10 minutes. It's, it's not really used in the clinic generally, um, but it's kind of what we're working for. So, we make this, uh, as we make it more automatically, analyzed and we can get some useful information from it as fast as possible and then we can get it to the clinic. Thank you. In the front. Thanks. Very interesting. Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, with the registration, uh, the flow is changing over time, I guess. And mm -hmm. what type of registration did you have to uh, use to uh, uh, cope with that? Yeah, so um, we are not using registration on the flow images. We're only using registration of, on the part of the images that contain anatomical information. So we are, yeah. So and it's, and it's then you point. interpolate. No, then, so we, we do use registration on the, those time frames, and then we can create, for example, a mask or another image, image that, uh, that uses, that we can put on top of the flow. But we will not do registration on the flow. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Our next talk is titled 3D Imaging from Video and Planar Radiography. Uh, it will be presented by Julian Fancio from INRIA. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, my name is Julian Fancio. I'm from INRIA Grenoble. And today I will talk to you about our latest work on 3D imaging uh, from video and planar radiography. And this is joint work with Edmond Boy. So our team, the Morpheo team, is a computer vision team. We are usually concerned with capturing shades in motion, typically using video cameras. But uh, recently we tried to get a peek at what was going on inside. Excuse me. And for that, we deployed a new, uh, sorry about that, the video is not playing. So essentially, we deployed a new platform called Keris, in which we combine 
10 video cameras with uh, one XYC arm and it allows us to get at the same time uh, at 30 frames per second the surface as well as the in-depth motion. So the idea is to capture surface information over time as well as volumetric attenuation over time. Uh, so as I said, our long-term goal would be to capture moving shapes, uh, both in surface and in depth for any kind of motion. And this paper is essentially the first step towards this goal, that is to uh, uh, capture this only for rigid or at least near rigid motion. So there are a number of existing techniques that uh, go that way, like EB, CT, or MDCT. Uh, I think we follow more the direction of uh, recent papers that combine marker-based motion capture with various forms of CT, except that we don't really want to use markers. Uh, first, because markers are obtrusive, uh, but also because we want to capture dense surface information and not only a, a discrete set of points. And also I have to note that these kind of methods are usually concerned with essentially uh, suppressing stray motion, like typically when the patient is moving within a CT scanner and it's creating artifacts, and he, we want to remove these artifacts. We want to do the opposite. Essentially, we want the patient to move, and we want to capture this motion. So the key idea of this, of this paper, the key idea, is not to move the X-ray imaging device, but on the opposite, to move the, the sample or to ask the patient to move within the acquisition volume. Then to recover the surface motion from videos, and finally to reconstruct a dense attenuation uh, volume using both motion from surface and X-ray information. So in this graph, the top row is the motion capture using video and the bottom is the X-ray reconstruction. So we start from uh, a set of uh, visible images over time. We combine them using gel hulls to get a 3D mesh. Then using some form of ICP, we get an initial pose, so over time we get some motion. Then we combine this motion with X-ray images that we capture over time as well. And since the two systems are jointly calibrated, uh, they are in a common frame of reference, and we can use this motion as well as the X-ray images uh, to get a 3D volume over time. And today I will then mostly focus on this reconstruction part. So how do we do that? Uh, we, we formalized our approach using a generative image formation model. So we start from a volumetric uh, volumetric representation of our sample. We apply a projection matrix to get essentially an ideal X-ray image. We apply a geometric uh, noise warp. We apply the 2D image noise as well, and that gives us a final image noise, uh, sorry, final image, which is essentially what we get from the, uh, uh, the X-ray CR. So what do we do with that? Uh, the problem is that obviously in reality we have the, to solve the backward problem. We do have these images in reality and what we really want is the, uh, the volume. So to do that we use a Bayesian framework which allows us, uh, knowing that the three components, so the, the actual attenuation volume, the 3D noise and the 2D noise are independent, to estimate all three of them independently using a map uh, estimation. This is essentially inspired from uh, typical super resolution approaches that have been used a lot. And so we initialize our volume with uh, another uh, tomography technique like ART. And then we cycle through estimating the volume given the 3D noise and the 2D noise. Then we estimate the 3D noise knowing the volume and the 2D noise. And finally, we can estimate as well uh, the 2D noise. I'm gonna now go a bit more into detail into that. So as for the actual volume estimation, we use uh, iteratively rated least square uh, with a TVL1 prior. Uh, the idea is that while the TVL1 favors uh, homogeneous area with sparse gradient responses, which is fairly well suited to uh, animal tissues. And you can see um, an example here. So on the left, 
there is no such prior and it's fairly noisy because the problem is ill posed given the number of, uh, of frames we use. It's quite limited on the right, however, uh, we have something much, much more homogeneous. We, nevertheless, with a strong gradients between the bones and the tissue and the other soft tissues. As for the 3D geometric noise, uh, this can arise from a number of uh, issues, for example, cross calibration between video and X-rays, uh, errors in motion capture as well, including potentially non-rigid motion and also synchronization errors. And we model this warp function as a, uh, we calculate it using optical flow between the original images on the left and the projected uh, volume given the current parameters. Uh, in the middle. So we calculate a flow between these two and that gives us a warp that caters for this error. And this is fundamental in our, uh, in our framework. I'm, not go I'm now gonna go through a few experiments and results. We have three data sets that are hand-centric. First, a fully simulated pipeline from a CT, uh, from CT images. Secondly, a actual forearm phantom that we put in our platform and third, uh, real hand in the platform. So first we simulated the whole pipeline, that is we used our CT scan, we render a simulated X-ray using ray casting, we render 10 video silhouettes, we didn't render full videos, we don't need that. That's enough to get a, a visual hull mesh. We rotate it roughly around 180 degrees over 32 frames by hand, so it's nothing very precise. And then we get uh, the following results. So here I'm showing you two slices with uh, root mean square error and mutual information score. Um, on the left to right, we have the ground truth city, which we can use here since this is synthetic data. The proposed methods then, and uh, in the middle, the proposed method without the optical flow, so without compensating for motion artifacts, are fairly similar because it's uh, synthetic data, so there is not much of that. And without L1 prior, so that here quite a significant um, significant artifact. Basically, the method barely converges because uh, with 32 frames, the problem is really ill-posed and uh, fails to converge. And then for comparison on the right, we have the comparison with art method that looks quite nice because it's uh, smooth. It's uh, fitted to L2 norm, basically, so it looks smooth. smooth. On the other hand, uh, it's losing a bit of sharpness uh, around the edges. And this is a, um, an, exa no, an example of uh, the actual input data. So here you have your 32 frames, simulated X-rays. And now I'm gonna go through the, the volume. So left to right, we have the ground truth city, the proposed method, the same without optical flow and then comparison with art. So in the middle, the video is gonna stop. There is a small artifact in the, in the phantom that is a hole. And you can see, for example, our method doesn't capture it because uh, it's smoothing things out because of the L2 norm. Well, with the proposed method, we do get it. Uh, then we put the actual forearm phantom, the one we scanned before, into the actual platform. And same thing again, we, use ten, we have actually 10 video cameras, one uh, X-ray C-arm, and this, this time we use only 20 frames. Again, we move it by hand, so it's nothing really precise, around 180 degree, but just by hand. We run our uh, process again. And here you can see that between the proposed method and without flow, uh, especially here, around the index finger, without the flow, we don't really capture the fact that the bone is literally hollow because it's a phantom. Uh, this is because probably the model was slightly misaligned and the flow, the optical flow captures uh, managed to capture and correct these small artifacts. We note also that here without prior, without TVL1 prior, it doesn't even uh, converge. And as comparison with art, here art is with only two frames, uh, 20 frames, so it fails to, I mean, it get, we get the general structure, but it fails to, to really converge because it doesn't have, again, a, a prior. And finally, we put uh, actual human hands inside our setup. Again, 20 frames. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a 
person that was live, so we try to enforce rigidity. However, we can't guarantee this is a real subject, so it's near rigid. And uh, we get basically a similar, uh, a similar comment as with the phantom. I'm just going to show you how it looks like in reality. So this is the 20 input uh, images, and now we are going to reproject them and compare them with art in 3D. So this is a simulated uh, images from uh, the recovered volume. And you can see that the proper method is much sharper than art again for the same reason, because of the lack of uh, L1 prior for art as well as the optical flow in our method. So in conclusion, I would simply say that uh, we are trying to combine video and X-ray to capture both surface and in-depth motion. Um, we've validated that on rigid or at least near rigid samples and obviously future work would be to uh, move on to fully non-rigid motion. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. We have time for some questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, why you have used uh, 10 cameras and what, what was your reconstruction technique for 3D reconstruction of the hand? Um, because given the size of the acquisition volume, 10 is, was sufficient uh, for the hand as well, which is not a very complex volume. For something that would have a more intricate surface, we could use more. For something that was simpler, we could use less. Uh, this just fits the purpose for that. Uh, and that's, uh, and then there was another question on the reconstruction technique, yeah. So we used uh, visual hulls here, so that's uh, computing silhouettes, intersecting them in 3D uh, to get a 3D mesh. Okay, thanks. All right, we'd like to thank the speaker. Thank you. Coming to the end of this session um, with a presentation on ASL Incorporated Pharmacokinetic Modeling of Pet Data with Reduced Acquisition Time. This is from the University of College London, presented by Catherine Scott. Okay, so today I'm going to uh, present our work which exploits the simultaneous acquisition of both PET and MRI data by incorporating blood flow information from MRI into PET kinetic modeling in order to reduce the overall acquisition time. And we've applied this methodology to amyloid PET data for the imaging of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of dementia, which affects over 45 million people worldwide and currently has uh, no cure and no effective treatment. So in the early stages of the disease, uh, neurotoxic proteins such as amyloid beta are deposited. These build up over many years and over time lead to brain atrophy and the cognitive impairment that we see when the patient presents to the clinic. So most imaging biomarkers focus on these later stages of disease because they're based on structural MRI. However, if we want to perform uh, effective intervention, we need to uh, get to the disease before these changes occur. So we need a biomarker which can um, image these early stages of dis the disease. PET traces, which can target the amyloid beta and other uh, proteins, have been developed. So this gives us a, an imaging technique so we can monitor the uh, deposition of this protein. Um, and with the advent of PET MRI scanners, we can combine this information from PET with MR, um, and the complementary information can improve our quantification of the data. So how do we quantify PET data? So following the injection of the tracer, we acquire dynamic data um, to monitor the delivery of the tracer to your tissue, the binding of the tracer to the imaging target, and then the subsequent washout of the tracer. So what we measure for each voxel is the concentration of the tracer in tissue over time, CT. We can then fit a model to our data to derive some parameters of interest, such as the target density. Um, this requires us to image the patient for approximately 60 minutes, which is not uh, feasible in a clinical setting, so we need a simplified approach. 
So generally within the clinic, um, the standardized uptake value ratio is uh, measured instead. So this is the ratio of the concentration of the tracer within the tissue, CT, divided by the concentration of the tracer within a reference tissue, where the reference tissue is defined as a region which is devoid of the imaging target, which in this case would be amyloid beta. Um, this requires just a 10 minute static acquisition of PET data, and you get a map of your relative uptake, which is related to your target density. However, in this case, we're not modeling the delivery or the washout of the tracer, so um, there will be a bias introduced when, um, due to the blood flow, which will affect both of these processes. And blood flow may change day to day and throughout the course of the disease. So the aim of this work was to perform kinetic modeling on just 30 minutes of PET data from 30 to 60 minutes post-injection and to incorporate uh, blood flow information from MRI which is acquired simultaneously with the PET data to reduce the overall acquisition time and get a map of our target density. So just to introduce the model, this is the simplified reference tissue model which is commonly used in neuropet um, modeling. So the model is set up as shown on the left. So you have an unknown concentration of your tracer within blood plasma which exchanges with two tissue regions. First, we have the concentration of the tracer within tissue, CT as before, and the other tissue is the reference tissue. So we now measure these uh, concentrations over time. And each tissue compartment has two rate constants associated with them, the K1, which is the rate constant from blood plasma into the tissue, and the K2 in the opposite direction. Now, from the differential equation set up by this model, we can derive the operational equation shown below. To solve this equation, we can uh, linearize this by generating a set of basis functions uh, based on plausible ranges for the parameters, and then we can do a least squares fitting to get our parameters of interest. So in this model, we have three parameters. The main parameter of interest uh, is the binding potential, BP, which is a combination of our target density, which is what we're interested in, and the tracer affinity. And since we can assume that the tracer affinity is the same across all regions of the brain and between subjects, any changes within the binding potential that we measure are changes, in our case, in amyloid burden. Another parameter which I should introduce is R1, which is the ratio of uh, K1 over K1 prime. So this is essentially the relative delivery between our tissue of interest and our reference region. So if we want to apply this model to a reduced acquisition time data, there are two modifications that we need to perform. Firstly, we need a reliable estimate of our R1 parameter because it's our early data which is um, dominated by this delivery information. And in this case, we're taking the last 30 minutes. Um, and the second modification that we need to make is that we need to have the full time series for the reference region curve in order to compute our convolution. So looking at our first modification and how we get this R1 parameter from our MRI data. So if we look at what K1 actually means, K1 is a combination of the blood flow and the extraction of the tracer. And the extraction itself will depend on both the vessel permeability and again the flow. So you have a nonlinear relationship between the two. However, if you assume that the vessel permeability is suitably high, then we can approximate this as a linear relationship. Now what we want is the R1, which is the K1 over the K1 prime. So if we can measure flow in our tissue and flow in a reference region, then we can get an approximation of our R1 value. So then we just need to get this flow measurement from MR data. So arterial spin labeling is an MR technique which is commonly used. So this is just an example from the literature in which uh, controls were scanned and some uh, dementia subjects. Now this form of dementia affected the posterior portion of the brain and this you can see that ASL can measure this uh, decreased flow in these regions. ASL itself uh, involves the uh, tagging of arterial blood uh, in the neck. The blood is then allowed to flow into the brain and exchange with the tissue, and then we acquire an image. Now this image will have a signal loss which is related to the amount of blood that has flowed in. So to get our R1 parameter from our ASL data, first of all, we acquire some control and some tagged images and find the difference to calculate our cerebral blood flow map. Next, because we need our relative value, so we divide our cerebral blood flow map by the average uh, value within our reference region. Then to find the relationship between our PET uh, parameter R1 and the relative CBF from the ASL, we took a subset of five subjects um, which had the full acquisition time. We calculated the R1 and the CBF for these uh, subjects, and we plotted them against one another and took a linear regression to get the relationship between the two. 
And this means that for any candidate uh, our relative CBS map, we can derive an R1 map. And this was all done on a regional basis. So that's the first modification dealt with. So now we need to look at the second modification where we need the full uh, reference region curve in order to compute our convolution. So in this case, we just have that last 30 to 60 minute time point. So we need to get the, derive these early time points from somewhere. So here we took a population of 14 subjects which had the full time series and we found the mean uh, population reference curve for those subjects. We then scale the uh, last 30 minutes of that population reference curve to our subjects of interest and then took those earlier time points from the population reference. So if we look back at our model for a single tissue compartment, the assumptions that we are making is that we can derive a subject specific value for K1 primes. K2 primes is defined by the population. And then we have um, the input function CP, which is uh, basically a scaled version of the population input function. So the data that we applied this to comes from the Insight 46 uh, study. Uh, which is a unique cohort of subjects who were all born within the same month in 1946 and have been studied throughout their lives. Um, at this point, now around their 70th birthday, they're now undergoing neuroimaging um, to look at the incidence of early stages of Alzheimer's disease within an apparently healthy po population. So all subjects were scanned on our Siemens uh, PET-MR scanner. They underwent 60 minutes of Im imaging following the injection of an amyloid beta tracer and during that 60 minutes, while the PET data is being acquired, a series of MR data is also being acquired, including five minutes of ASL. So we analyzed for this work six subjects over 15 different regions. We took our gold standard value to be uh, the full 60 minutes of PET data fitted with the simplified reference tissue model. And then we compared our proposed method using 30 minutes of PET data and the ASL. And we also calculated the SUVR for comparison. So to look at the results, this plot shows the estimated amyloid burden against our gold standard, which is the full 60 minutes of PET data with our SRTM model. So here you can see the green line is the linear regression through all the points through all the subjects with the 95% confidence interval uh, in the shaded region. And you can see that for SUVR, we have this overestimation of the amyloid burden, um, which is this bias introduced by our blood flow information from the lack of blood flow information. If we compared this to the proposed method in blue, um, we can say that we've greatly reduced this bias and we're much closer to the line of identity. And if we look at a taken uh, subject, for example, so the top row shows our estimate of amyloid burden for each of te the techniques, and on the bottom we've got the absolute difference maps. So as shown by the plot for the SEVR, you have this overestimation of the amyloid burden across the, the brain. And in the proposed method, this difference has been greatly reduced. Now, if we take the best, uh, the best case scenario where we think we can truly get the absolute R1 value from our ASL data, um, this, is, this is the ideal case for, the, for this data. So to test this, we took uh, the true R1 parameter derived from the full 60 minutes of PET data and applied that with our uh, extrapolated reference region and just 30 minutes of data. And that's the last image where you can see we um, almost eliminated the difference between using this 30 minutes of data and our gold standard. So if we go back to our plot across all the different subjects and now add on, if we can get our absolute estimate of the R1 from my ASL data, you can see that uh, the line now almost follows directly along the line of identity and we've uh, reduced our variation as well. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have presented um, a technique using just 30 minutes of a pet uh, MR acquisition which can perform uh, comparably to the full 60 minutes of um, modeling, um, which also reduces the bias compared to the comparable me method of the SEVR. This technique should be generalizable to other traces and other models, um, and we applied this directly to clinical data which came from um, the study. So finally, I would just like to thank everyone who is involved in this work, um, and also the participants in the Insight 46 study for giving up their time to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple minutes for questions. While well, people move their ways to microphones, I'll shoot one. Um, so this is really interesting work. Your con population was mostly controls, I heard. Um, was there any range of amyloid deposition, and do you have any concerns of how this would work with a broader range of subjects? 
Yeah, so that's something we definitely need to evaluate and that we have a very restricted uh, set of subjects that we're applying this to. So they're all apparently healthy. Um, some of them will have amyloid uh, deposition. We didn't um, split them out in any way. Um, so some of them will have some deposition, but we're hoping to get some uh, data where we will be able to see how this applies to the wider population. Um, the technique should be able to be applied in the same way, um, but we have to see when we test it on some other data. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're ready to conclude the session. So let's give all the speakers a hand. Um, and then a note. Just, just one quick thing. Um, don't miss the bus at 6.15 to the gala dinner. Thank you all.